Hello there, and welcome to my session. Before I start the session, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Animesh Chaudhary, and I work as academic head for the Wall Street School. By qualification, I'm done with my graduation in accounting and finance. Then I did my PG in management accounting, my MBA in finance, and CIMA, which is a chartered qualification into management accounting from UK. So in this session, the agenda is that I will introduce you with PM subject of ACC. What is the subject all about? How the exams are structured? And then finally, how you can proceed in this. And also, I will be teaching you a very small topic to give you a flavor that what the subject is all about. So without any further ado, let's begin. PM. It stands for Performance Management. Now, this subject is heavily dependent on MA subject of ACCA knowledge level. MA means management accounting. Now, don't get confused with the word accounting. You don't have to make PL account, balance sheet, cash flow statement, and all those things. Okay. It is very, very different from your financial accounting. Let me tell you how. So, financial accounting is more like a rule based subject. Let me give an example. So, we have a standard called IFRS 5, which is non current asset held for sale. So, according to the standard, there are some features which we have to meet and then only we can classify the non-current asset as held for sale, otherwise not. So if you really see, we have standards given to us and we have to follow those standards, standards as rule. Right? But MA as a subject and PM as a subject is more logic based. Now, having said that, I don't mean that we don't need logic for FA. Yes, we do. We do need logic. But all that logic will revolve around the rule, the standards given to us. Yeah. But in PM, the logic will revolve around the business acumen that we possess. OK? And because of the need of logic, and the need of business acumen, what truly are you learning in performance management is decision making. That how you can make or take effective decisions for your business. Very, very critical. And that's what makes this subject interesting, fun, but challenging. If you will see the passing percentage of PM, it is the lowest among the skill level subjects. Yes, you heard me right. And I'm not telling you to uh, make you afraid about it. I want you to be aware that it is challenging. Approximately four people clear it out of 10. Why? Because understand. Okay. so. There can be two situations or two scenarios. Scenario number one, that you are done with your knowledge level, you are you have cleared your MS subject, and then you are getting into PM. Or scenario two, that because of your previous qualification, you got some exemptions. So I am very much okay that you have got exemptions. But please uh, let us be honest with each other. If you are the former scenario, if you're coming from the former situation that you have done with your MA, nothing like it, very good. But if you are coming with exemption, understand that when you are doing your uh, graduation, your uh, school or any other qualification, for most of the people, the thing is the way you were taught or the way you learned it, your priorities at that point of time. The concept that you, that is expected from you to know, you don't really know it. Okay, so you may have mugged up the subject, mugged up the concept, and you vomited that you know in the exam, but you don't really understand them. And that is the very very first reason that why we have so low passing percentage in PM. But you don't need to worry. Why? Number one, because we have created something called as bridge course, where 
we have picked the important topics coming from MA, BT, and SA, which is coming from your knowledge level. Not the entire subject, but the most important one, which you need to know. You must need to know. And they are self-explanatory. And of course, after seeing those uh, recording, you can come to us for your doubts. We will be more than happy to you know, answer them. Okay. So once you are done with those uh, bridge course recordings, you will be at par to understand PM subject very well. Yeah. Second reason. You simply have to follow my instruction, my guidance. Okay. And you have to be very, very uh, attentive in my lectures. And I can assure you that you will clear this subject at one go. Now, I'm into this teaching industry, this education industry for the last 10 years, approximately a decade now. Yeah. And I have seen a lot of students. And uh, by God's grace, uh, I have produced a lot of rank holders. So when you're in my batch, that will be my aim again that I want, I will be, you know, pushing you forward to bring ranks. I will be pushing you to start developing logical mind. And at the beginning, it may bring you some discomfort. But please have faith in me that I am doing that for your betterment. I want you to develop that logic. I want to develop that business acumen, which you can't develop overnight. Okay, you will have to keep pushing yourself and I will be guiding you. I will be making you do so. But believe me, all that struggle will pay off when you will get your result. I guarantee that. Yeah. Now let's see the syllabus. So your PM subject in total has 15 chapters. I will repeat. PM subject in total has 15 chapters. Chapter number one is all about revising your MA subject very briefly, very, very briefly, which I personally believe is not enough for you to know for your PM subject. And that's why the bridge course. Yeah. So if you remove that chapter number one, because on that, you will not be asked questions in the exam specifically. You just need to know them for your further understanding of all the other chapters. Yeah. So if I remove chapter, chapter number one, then we have in total 14 chapters that we need to study. Yeah. Now these 14 chapters are divided into uh, five sections. A, B, C, D, E. I'll repeat. These 14 chapters are divided into five sections. Section A, Section B, C, D, E. So your chapter number two and three comes from section A. So if you see, this chapter is more about how to record data, you know, how to churn information out of the data, how to control the data, how to use technology into it. So, you know, AI, uh, big data, all those things. So these two chapters are not really conceptual. There, there is no concept. It is more information that you need to be aware about. So when I say that, uh, you will be learning AI, not hardcore AI, just the brief awareness of that this kind of things exist. Yeah. Then your chapter number four is entirely one different section, which is section B. So in this, you will be learning concepts like activity based costing, target costing, lifecycle costing, throughput accounting and stuff. Yeah. Then your section C where you have chapter number five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So this section is more about decision-making or more precisely short-term decision-making. So uh, cost-benefit analysis, like uh, you have to know, you need to know break-even analysis, uh, how to make uh, present decisions based out of different, different factors like cost, market scenario, competition, customer, yeah. Then uh, if you want to do some production and you have some material which is in limited quantity, you don't have adequate quantity of the materials or labors or any other resource, then how you have to optimize your production plan. Okay. Or if you have got some project, 
then uh, how you will say yes to that project or how you, you will decide to say no to that project. Right? And then uh, because you're in business, of course, risks are involved. Some uncertainties are involved and in how you can identify them. Okay, how you can identify the impact of those risks onto your business. And then you know, planning your uh, business further accordingly. So this will be the uh, discussion area from this section. Then section D, which is budgetary uh, budgets and control. So chapter 10, 11, 12 are coming from it. Budgeting, as we know, you are simply laying down the plan of action for your uh, future course of business. Right? In, quantit in quantitative techniques, you are simply doing forecasting using different, different, uh, I can say techniques like high low method, like linear regression, like learning curves. Yeah. And then we have advanced variance. Variance simply means that, okay, you made some plan. Now you're uh, doing the actual performance. So your actual performance might have a divergence from your original plan. That divergence can be good, that it can it is boosting the profit, or it can be bad, that it is reducing your profit. So you have to analyze those divergences, and uh, and you have to try to mitigate the bad divergence. So this is what advanced finance is all about. And then last we have section E, which is performance measurement and control, chapter 13, 14, and 15. So over here you will uh, learn how to measure the performance. Because it should not happen that you are only performing, but you are never analyzing whether you are performing good or bad. So you have to do the performance measurement for the entire company, for particular divisions, right? And also, if your company is a not-for-profit organization, because if you are not-for-profit, then doing the performance measurement is, you know, is a bit different because there is no profit involved. Yeah. So this is your syllabus of PM subject. Pretty interesting, right? It is. Now let us talk about your exam, your exam structure. So you will be having in total 100 mark exam. Okay. And uh, how it will be done? So you'll be having three sections section A, section B, and section C. Now, please don't get confused by the same term that ACC used for the syllabus and for the exam. Okay. These sections A, B, C, D, E are syllabus area sections. This section A, B, C is exam section. Okay. So exam section A, you'll be asked 15 questions of two mark each which is 30 mark. Yeah. So this will be your objective type question. Objective type means MCQs, fill in the blanks, true, false, match the followings, those kind of thing. Let me show you one question that can uh, make you understand this in a better way. Yeah. So this is one of the sample for your section A type of question. So short and simple, some you know uh, option because it is MCQ type question. Take it pretty pretty simple. So this is your section A. Okay. Now section B, this will not be you know exactly objective type. Okay, so it will be objective type, but based on some case style question. I will repeat, section B will be objective type questions, but based on some case style question. So there will be three cases given to you. Okay. For each case, there will be five questions, five objective questions. And each objective question will be of two marks each. I will repeat, there will be three cases given to us in section B. Each case will have five questions of two marks each. So again, 30 marks. Again, let me just give you one uh, sample for it. Here it is. 
you can see you have been given this case so from here to here it is the case given to us and then you have five questions on that case each question of two mark each yeah and then last the most challenging one which is section c where you will be asked only two questions but of 20 marks each which is 40 marks okay but this section c two questions they will be subjective or in acc language it will be constructive exam question so over here what will happen is you'll be given a case and on that case you have to develop your understanding and you have to solve for that case okay let me just show you a question again for better understanding see so you have a case given to you so you have to go through that case understand the situation of the business okay and then there'll be some requirement so you can see that you have to you you could be asked to calculate some stuff and then discuss and recommend also okay so it is not really objective it is constructive so you have to construct your answer by developing some understanding about the case and then uh, you know establishing your logics from the concept that you have learned and then construct the answer so this is your section c of 40 marks so you can see that in total it is 100 marks 30 30 60 and then 40 100 now in order to clear you have to score minimum 50 marks to clear okay passing is 50 yeah now understand the entire uh, exam will be of three hours three hours means 180 minutes so in 180 minutes you have to score 100 mark which means what which means that you have to get uh you will be getting only 1.8 minutes to score one mark i'll repeat you have to spend only 1.8 minute to earn that one mark if you will you know use that uh, mathematics then you can say that you have 30 into 1.8 which is 54 minutes for your section a for your section a okay and in section a you have 15 questions right so 54 divided by 15 which means that for every one question you have only 3.6 minutes okay so every question of section a you have only 3.6 minutes and the same will be there for your section b each question only 3.6 minutes and using the same mathematics for each question of your section c you have only 36 minutes why i'm telling you this so that you are aware that how you have to manage your time because if you will you know do your time management like this you'll be able to complete your uh, you know uh, exam on time or else you'll struggle time management is very important yeah i hope i hope i'm making sense with all of these things yeah so now what i will do this was all about your uh, subject 
the introduction of the subject. Now let me just pick one uh, topic uh, that will help you to understand this subject a better way. You'll understand that what exactly you're getting into. And you'll get a flavor of your PM subject. So let's see. So the uh, topic that I want to take is high-low method. Okay. High, low method. Okay. Now this is coming from the chapter called quantitative techniques. Okay. Where you have to learn how to do forecasting. Where you have to learn how to do forecasting. Okay. Now, in order to do forecasting, what you really need is you need historical data. So there has to be some historical data of the business. So whatever activities you performed in the history, that data needs to be available. So it will be available. It will be given to us. On this data, we have to run our analysis. By running our analysis, we will be getting you know, some uh, some insight that how the business is performing, uh, you know, how things are actually working for the business. And using that insight, we will do our forecasting. As simple as that. Okay, so this is what we want to uh, achieve. This is our result. Okay. So in quantitative, in quantitative techniques of forecasting, what we really are doing is doing analysis by using different different techniques and high low method is one of them so high low method is a technique to analyze the data so that we can do the forecasting okay so of course in the chapter we have a lot of different techniques as well but for now only high low method we will be discussing about now before we actually jump into high low method there are some you know fundamentals uh, uh, fundamentals concept that you need to know Again, coming from MA. So, assuming this that uh, you don't know it, just the assumption. Let me just quickly, you know, uh, touch upon those uh, concepts before we jump into high low method. So, we have something called variable cost. We have something called variable cost. So, variable cost is the cost which varies as per production. I will repeat, variable cost is the cost that varies as per production. Why? Because it is dependent on production. It is dependent on production. Yeah, let me just quickly uh, help you with an example. So let's say that I am in a business of uh, producing and selling laptops. I'm in a business of producing and selling laptops so of course i need a lot of different materials for the same for example i need this webcam lens right and let's say that i have this sony as my supplier who provides me with this lens as a material okay it's pretty straightforward so let's say that the cost of lens is 100 okay per unit cost of lens is 100. So every single lens that I order from Sony, I have to pay 100 for each lens. Okay, now see, if I have a no laptop to produce, if I have zero laptops to produce, will I purchase any lens? The answer is no. So how much will be my cost in that case? Zero. Right? Let's say that I want to produce one laptop. And for that one laptop, I need that one lens. And that one lens is of 100 rupees. So what's my total cost? It is 100. Let's say that I want to produce two laptops. For that, I need two lens, each lens of 100 each. So what is my total cost? Two and 200, 200. Now, three laptops, three lens are needed. 100 each, total cost 300. Four laptops I want to produce, I need four lenses, 100 each, and my total cost is 400. So if you're seeing, as per my level of production, 
my cost is increasing. So if my production is increasing, then my total cost of lens is also increasing. Total cost of lens is also increasing. Why? Because the cost of lens is dependent on how much I'm producing. So it is my variable cost. Okay. So in variable cost, the total variable cost, it varies, which we have just seen. Yeah. But our variable cost per unit remains constant. See, the cost per lens was always 100. So this is my variable cost. Pretty easy, right? Then we have something called fixed cost, which is completely opposite to what variable cost is. So it doesn't varies. It doesn't varies as per production. And why it doesn't vary is because it is not dependent on production. And again, let me help you with an example. So, okay, I want to produce the laptops. And for that, I have taken a factory on rent. I have taken a factory on rent. And I have to pay, uh, let's say, uh, uh, 50,000 rupees for a month to my landlord. Now tell me, if I'm producing zero laptop, I'm producing absolutely no laptop, will I don't have to pay to my uh, landlord the rent amount? The answer is no, still I have to, right? Landlord is least bothered whether I'm producing my laptops or not. I have to pay him no matter what. So if I'm producing zero laptop or one laptop or two laptop or three laptop or four laptop or any n number of laptops, I have to pay him the same rent amount, which is of 50,000. It is fixed. It is constant. It is not changing. Yeah. So this is what my fixed cost is. So I can simply say that my total cost, my absolute total cost is nothing but fixed cost plus the variable cost. Okay. My total cost is nothing but fixed cost plus variable cost. And my variable cost is nothing but variable cost per unit into unit. Right, we saw that over here. So 1 into 100 is 100, 2 into 100 is 200, 3 into 100 is 300. So unit into per unit is my total variable cost. Okay. Now that we have understand, you know, uh, what variable cost is and what fixed cost is. Now let us understand the HILO method. Okay. So HILO method, we have to perform some steps in order to get it done. So step number one, okay. we have to get the data. We have to get the data. So let me just bring a data for you to practice upon. Okay. So this is the data. See, the total cost incurred at various output levels in a factory have been measured as follows. So we have this output level, which is our units. And then we have been given the total cost, which means fixed cost plus variable cost. So we will understand high-low method by using this question. So we, so we will understand and solve the question both at the very same time. Yeah. So very first thing was to get the data and we have the data given to us in the question. So data will always be available for you. Okay. Data will always be available for you. Okay. Let's see the data. So uh, 
we have units, we have the cost requirement. Using Hilo method, analyze the total cost in fixed and variable component. So basically, we have to, you know, uh, bifurcate the total cost into fixed and variable component. And then what? And then we have to forecast that if we are producing 75 units in the upcoming uh, month, in the future, then what will be my total cost? We have to do forecast. If we are producing 75 units in the upcoming month, then what will be my total cost? Okay. So step number two after that, and that is identify the highest unit and its cost. Identify the highest unit and its cost. And if you will see this data, you will find that 50 unit is the highest. And this is the cost of it. Marking it separately, highest. Okay. Then step number three, identify the lowest unit and its cost. Again, if you will see the data, then we will find that 26 is my lowest unit and the cost of the same is this. 6566 and highlighting this separately. So once we have identified the units and its cost, then step number four, apply the formula. Apply the formula. Let's see the formula. The formula is cost at highest unit minus cost at lowest unit upon highest unit minus lowest unit. See the formula again. In the numerator, you have cost at the highest unit minus cost at the lowest unit, whole divided by in the denominator, you have highest unit minus lowest unit. The question is, what do we get after we have applied this formula? We get variable cost per unit. We get variable cost per unit. How? Let me decode the formula for you. Let me first decode the numerator. So it is cost at the highest, which means that fixed cost at highest plus variable cost at highest. Right? This is what cost at highest means. Simply open up the formula minus cost at lowest unit, which means fixed cost at lowest unit. My, uh, plus variable cost at lowest unit. So this is my numerator. If I simply open up the brackets, then this is how my numerator will look like. Fixed cost at highest plus variable cost at highest minus fixed cost at lowest minus variable cost at lowest. Now we know that fixed cost no matter if it is at highest unit or at the lowest unit, they will be same. They will be constant. They will be of same amount. So they will cancel each other out. Right? Fixed cost is constant. We have just, just learned that. Right? Fixed cost is constant. It doesn't change. It doesn't vary as for the production. So they're canceling each other out. But variable cost at highest and variable cost at lowest, it varies. They are different in amount. So ultimately, what are we getting from the numerator? We are getting change in variable cost. Variable cost at highest minus variable cost at lowest is nothing but change in variable cost. And now see the denominator, highest unit minus lowest unit is nothing but change in units. Okay, so, so if you will see this formula, I can rearrange that. Right? I can say that variable cost per unit okay, is nothing but variable cost upon unit. Okay, and that is what happening below. The change in variable cost upon change in unit is nothing but variable cost per unit. That is simple, right? See, it is all logical. It is all logical. If you will get the logic, things are super duper easy. 
Yeah, let's apply the formula over here in the question. So we have to find variable cost per unit, and we have the highest cost given to us, 7310. We have the lowest cost given to us, 6566. Highest unit is 50, and the lowest unit is 26. Right? So what will be our variable cost per unit? Let's see that, 7310 minus 6566, whole divided by 50 minus 26. So it is 31. So 31 dollar is my variable cost per unit. So if you really see, we have kind of got my variable component. Now using that, I can also find my fixed component. Again, using a simple logic that we learned in the uh, this sheet. I will use the formula of total cost for the same. Okay. So uh, let's say at highest unit, which is 50 units. So total cost is equal to fixed cost plus variable cost. And variable cost is nothing, and variable cost is nothing but variable cost per unit into unit. Right? Total cost is equal to fixed cost plus variable cost, and variable cost is nothing but variable cost per unit into units. So do we know the total cost at highest? Yes, we do. It is 7310. Do we know the fixed cost? No, we don't. Do we know the variable cost per unit? Yes, we know it now, 31. Do we know the units? Of course we do. It is 50 units. So if you, if you really see, fixed cost is your balancing figure. So how much it is? 7310 minus 31 into 50, which is uh, 5760. My fixed cost is 5760. Yeah. I can find the same thing at lowest also. And fixed cost has to be same at that uh, lowest unit also. See, at lowest unit, which is 26 unit. Again, repeating, my fixed cost should be same at this uh, level also. It has to be constant. So total cost is equal to fixed cost plus variable cost, and variable cost is variable cost per unit into units. Do we know the total cost at lowest? Yes, we do. 6566 six, six it is. Fixed cost, balancing figure, variable cost per unit is 31, and units is 26. Let's find our fixed cost now. 6566 six, minus 31 into 26. 5760 C. So I have got my variable component and also I have got my fixed component. Now I can use both of them to find my total cost at 75 units. See. So total cost at 75 units that is what we want to find again the same thing total cost is equal to fixed cost plus variable cost per unit into unit fixed cost is 5760 variable cost is 31 and unit is 75 is equal to 5760 plus 31 into 75 so my total cost at 75 units is 8085. And see, we did the forecasting. So if we are producing 75 units in the future, as per our past trend, as per our past behavior, we are expected to occur a cost of $8085. So this is your high low method. Okay. So if you really see, your high row method is not really taking all the data points into the analysis. It hasn't. It ignored this 13 minutes, 33, 44, 40 minutes. It simply ignored them. It took only the two extreme point, the highest point and the lowest point, the two extreme point. And all the points in between was ignored. Right? So this is one of the disadvantage of using this method. 
so this method is super easy to do super easy to understand super quick fast to perform and that's why it is favorite of many uh, analyst but at the same time because you are kind of ignoring a lot of data points in between the two extreme point you will find that whatever components of variable cost and fixed cost you have got it might not satisfied in the data points in between so 31 variable cost per unit and the fixed cost that we have got which was 5760 it might not satisfy the data point in between which means that the analysis of your trend and the behavior of the past is not exactly 100% accurate with hilo method again why because you have ignored a lot of data points in between while doing that analysis okay and that is where you have further more techniques in the chapter uh, which kind kind of keeps evolving and uh, keeps making you to forecast with more accuracy yeah but we will do that uh, in a due course of time when i will see you in my batch uh, that is it for the day i hope you enjoyed the session i hope you understood that pm subject is super easy super fun it is easy only when you understand the logic okay but of course because it is logical it is super fun yeah so on that note i will say you all a goodbye and hopefully i will see you in my batch meanwhile take care